Welcome to the forum. Uh, the Lindsay Institute is sponsoring. The Lindsay Institute is a research and policy center at UNLV that was uh, funded by Kirk Kikorian and through the originally the Lindsay Foundation and the Dream Fund. And the Dream Fund actually paid for this project. Uh, why this topic? Well, I was one of the co-authors of the State Economic Development Report in 2011. And it became immediately apparent that health in Southern Nevada was underperforming. Especially, it was underperforming throughout the state, but especially in Southern Nevada. And we identified it as an industry constraint, the absence of a med school, an allopathic med school in Southern Nevada uh, is an industry constraint. Las Vegas is, and it says here, by far, big emphasis, the largest metro in the U.S. without an allopathic med school. In fact, it's the biggest by over a million people. So yeah, you can go through the top 50 U.S. metros, which all have over a million in population, places like Richmond on up. And out of that group, Las Vegas is singular in that it does not have an allopathic med school. And I knew this as far back as the middle of the last decade, working on projects uh, at the Brookings Institution back in DC. Las Vegas's population, just for benchmark here, is now at two million. It's ranked 31st in the US. There is also a larger space that's relevant for medicine because people in places like Kingman are using our services. And the census has an identification of this and it started actually our designation for this began February 28th, 2013. This is a new statistic called the Combined Statistical Area. It's an old statistic. It's a decade old. In fact, it's something I worked on back in DC. But it is a new statistic applied here in the case of, we used to just have Nye County in this. We picked up Mojave County's 200,000 residents. We have 2.25 million people. We're ranked 27th in the US. And what's interesting is, despite the depth of the recession that we suffered, we gained 50,000 people from 2010 to, tw to 2012. That's the headcount in April 1st, 2010, to the July 1st estimate, 2012. Uh, almost 50,000, to put that in context, that's practically like Ed in Carson City, in the two most impacted years that you see in terms of the reduction in our gross domestic product and employment. So you see these numbers up here, I'm sorry, they're small, but the 8.4 and 9, percent is what we're still down as a share of the peak in 2007. And by the way, most of what we're down is construction. The first business of Las Vegas was entertainment and tourism, and the second business of Las Vegas was building Las Vegas. And the building Las Vegas part went away. Hopefully something like health, which is underperforming, could substitute a lot of employment in that sector because it's not likely that Las Vegas will have the kind of construction employment it once did. It's probably not good for it to have the construction employment it once did. So Las Vegas' health sector is the smallest in the US in the top 100 metros. This came from a report earlier this year under the Brookings Metro Monitor. They did a supplemental for health and they looked at employment. And again, the top 100 US metros are the focus of these reports. And of that, we had just 7% of jobs in the region in the health sector, we should have over 10% to give you perspective. And these are tens of thousands additional jobs if we had what was our predicted share. Also, in the Brookings SRI study in 2011, Las Vegas had what's called a location coefficient for health services. 0.642 is roughly 64.2%. It translates, it's, it goes into a whole number. So we're missing just ballpark, about a third of medicine. So instead of having about 18% of gross domestic product in the region attached to health, we're at 12%. That is more than the current figure for the construction industry, to put that in perspective. What does it mean to be down? We'll take questions later. Uh, are these slides going to be available? Oh yeah, sure. Yep. What does it mean to be down by that much? What does it mean to be missing that? Well, the biggest thing that we produce is tourism services. And we're very successful at it. In fact, Brookings has all the most recent data on exports. And it's amazing how much exports, meaning to foreign, you know, to foreign countries, to, to places like China, and to, you know, to tourists from Great Britain and so on, but also managing China, have provided a growth, a lift for us, in the last couple of years. Uh, yet, 
what we're doing, and we don't make much, we make gaming equipment. By the way, that looks like uh, sporting goods when you look at it in the statistics. There was this breathless Brookings uh, staffer that ran to me one day and said, did you know you guys make a lot of sporting goods? Like we were making like surfboards or something. You know, I said, no, that's gaming equipment, okay. So what we have is a, pl uh, a region that is successful in exporting service, not just within the world, but also to the rest of the US. So if you look at our exchanges with Southern California, and Brookings is drilling down on this right now, what we sell Southern California is tourism services. What they sell us is health services. And we almost wipe out the value, the wealth building capacity of the service export through our need to import the most expensive consumer service. So to diversify our economy, step one would be not to invent a new technology or capture a new industry. It's as simple as this. If Las Vegas did its health services at anywhere near the predicted share it is supposed to, it would add tens of thousands of jobs and reduce the consumption of other regions' health services and the building of other regions' wealth. And so a difference between us and the other largest city in the U.S. that is a specialist in export of health services is Orlando, is that they do a much better job in securing the requisite share of the predicted amount of health services for a region that size. Now, new allopathic med schools, over a dozen have been built since 2000, sometimes in similar markets like Orlando, but sometimes in Roanoke, Virginia. Now, my last job was at Virginia Tech, where I was faculty and running a center. And I was there when they were building this thing and when they were planning this thing in Roanoke. Let me tell you about Roanoke. When you go to, uh, I used to go between Alexandria, Virginia, which is the northern campus, and Blacksburg, and you go past Roanoke on two exits on I-81. Roanoke has 280,000 people. It is not the most impressive city. It's a nice little city. Uh, the capital costs on these buildings are actually modest, and there are lots of finance options. The University of Central Florida, and by the way, Jeb Bush is the great builder of medical schools because he approved and greenlighted multiple medical schools. He also wanted the medical schools not to be branches of the University of Florida, as Paul Umbach will describe, but actually uh, helping build UCF, uh, University of Central Florida, into a Carnegie Research Very High, which it most recently achieved. And the med schools in South Florida are going to do the same for similar branch institutions of the state system in Florida. The Virginia Tech Med School cost 59 million, so what did it cost up in UCF? 68 million. Interestingly, a big source of this was philanthropy, and the philanthropic efforts were so successful that the school had the money to send the first several classes completely free, totally free. And the interesting thing is that that lifted the student population and quality of students so much that, you know, legend has it somebody had a perfect MCAT that, uh, you know, that they were really sort of like Harvard's students, if you will, because of that, uh, that contribution, because it's free med school. Virginia Tech School in Roanoke, 59 million. Interestingly, Green Spun Hall, the building we're in right here, cost 94 million. So, you know, the, the building costs, the capital costs of a med school are fairly modest in that a building like this has many more students. There's not as many med students. They're expensive to build for, for per student, but the amount of students you have in a medical school is fairly low. By contrast, this is a school with a couple of thousand students in it. So, 68 million Orlando, you can go online and you look at these little conversion uh, websites between 75 and 80 million it would cost here. Funding sources, you know, you just don't need the state on this. There's federal new market tax credits. There's CRA requirements that banks have, and that's the Consumer Reinvestment Act of 1977. So large banks, JP Morgan, for example, are always looking to do deals in Las Vegas because they are stuck with, essentially, demonstrating to the federal government, which they've been in trouble with lately, that they are doing the right thing by investing in low-income communities, by returning wealth to low-income communities out of the deposits that they've received from those communities. These kinds of deals, doing a med school in a neighborhood that's identified as an appropriate space for new market tax credits, or the new Nevada new market tax credits that were passed in 2013. The local counties and, the local counties and local uh, municipalities can raise bonds as well. That's how they got, they got it done in uh, Phoenix, actually. And they did adaptive reuse of an existing structure in Phoenix, and we have some possibilities for adaptive reuse. In fact, <clears throat> whichever locality gets this has a jump in the biomedical sector. 
So this is something, and again, it's not that substantial amount of money to raise. This is something that uh, a lot of municipalities and certainly the county are interested in. <coughs> the other thing is, if there's one thing we know in Las Vegas, it's how to do real estate deals. So it's not something that's a skill set that's beyond the, the region. Just take a look at the strip. Uh, our skyline, there's a website called Emporis that ranks skylines. It's the second in the West after Los Angeles. It's 49th ranked in the world in power of a skyline, meaning the height of the buildings. It has a tremendous amount of foreign investment. It has a tremendous amount of creative finance that it has been used in application for it. Bottom line is if Roanoke can build a medical school, I'm guessing Las Vegas can as well. <laughs> nope. No, not. I love Roanoke. Great farmer's market. <clears throat> a lot of fun. Well, they do. A lot of fun on a Sunday morning, you know, but it's Roanoke. And this is the city, this is the city of lights. Uh, uh, so today, uh, Trip Umbaugh will cover the economic impact, especially of the, the medical school in Las Vegas. I'm going to invite Brian McAnallen from the LV Metro to come up here and make a few more remarks about the Chamber's interest because this is mostly today about the sort of business of the med school and I thought it was relevant that the Chamber weigh in. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lang. Well, I uh, want to pass on a couple messages, I think, from the business community. For those of you who don't know, we represent the uh, uh, large, we're the largest business community in the state. We represent 6,000 businesses with over 230,000 employees uh, that we call members of the Las Vegas Metro Chamber. And the business community is extremely interested in this issue. First off, uh, you know, from the basic information that I think uh, Mr. Rumbaugh will share on the economic impact and what it will bring to uh, Southern Nevada is hugely important. But even more than that, let's talk about um, health care as sort of an economic driver, right? If, if we're out there trying to uh, bring economic development opportunities to our state and specifically southern Nevada, we're recruiting businesses from out of state and we're keeping businesses that are here. One of the ways to do that is to fix our education system, but also to work on health care and make sure that we have good quality health care in this state. And I think we do, but one of the ways we can kind of improve that is to move in this direction. Being a large metro without an allopathic medical school, we've got to fix that particular problem. Now I think we've got a great osteopath <coughs> medical school here with Toro, and I've had the privilege of touring that uh, facility on a couple different occasions, and I think they're doing a fantastic job producing medical students today. But you also need allopathic medical students uh, in order to succeed as well, and we need to have that discussion for Southern Nevada. It sounds like we've moved from where we used to be, which is, does Southern Nevada need a medical school to, we'll get a medical school in Southern Nevada. Now we need to start having a conversation about what we want this to look like, how it should be organized, structured, and stood up. And I think that that's pretty important. And I think uh, one message I would want to deliver to everybody here today is that the business community needs to be part of that. The entire Southern Nevada community needs to be part of that discussion. We need to be able to shape the way in which this is done. Uh, you'll hear that uh, in other places where they've brought an allopathic medical school, the business community and the larger community were all vital to that discussion and making sure that it happens. And we're here today to be part of that discussion and to help move our state forward and our southern Nevada region with a new medical school. Um, Many of you may not know that you know, we're still in the uh, Great Recession, at least. We're still on the tail end while other communities are recovering. We still have the highest unemployment in the nation. Do you know the only sector that was absolutely recession-proof? Healthcare. Absolutely recession-proof. Went on to hire more people while everyone was laying off, cutting back, and, and making, uh, making adjustments been part of four presentations where you look at the bar charts on where the um, uh, jobs were lost in construction and where the jobs were gained and healthcare is way on the other end and it's the only sector that was hiring through the recession. If that's the case, we need to, and, and for the past two recessions which are minor compared to the one that we've just been through, healthcare is actually where we ought to be making our investment and driving in that. Part of the economic development plan is for looking at, at tourism uh, opportunities for uh, healthcare tourism. 
and to be able to make those investments there and, and to be able to um, ensure that we've got quality medical care in our Southern Nevada region. All of these issues tied together, uh, it should be very clear why we want to be a partner in this discussion, why the community needs to be a partner in this discussion, and how we can help make this successful and move our state forward. Um, I uh, just had the opportunity yesterday of walking down downtown Phoenix, a um, place I'm pretty familiar with, but um, having been away for a few years and coming back, I walked past the medical school in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. Um, it came into what used to be a uh, blighted area that no one ever went to, buildings that were shuttered. The amazing thing is that, you know, a mere seven years later, uh, now you have economic development, businesses that have grown out of there, uh, empty lots around that medical school that have been built up supplying extra businesses, uh, restaurants and um, retail establishments, as well as uh, other office uh, buildings to help set up and support that medical school down there. That community has really become a vibrant downtown community. And one of the key factors of changing that downtown area that people were only there from eight to five, now they're there all the time, is the medical school moving in there. The bioscience sector for Phoenix, Arizona has just grown. And the investments that have been made and the patents that have come out of that and the developments and the opportunities and the, the growth that, that Phoenix has seen from its medical school is just remarkable. But for me, being able to see it as an empty lot a few years ago, and only a vision and hoping that it would happen, and now being able to walk past it yesterday, it kind of painted a picture for me. The future for us in Southern Nevada and what we could have and where we could go by making these investments. So I am very pleased with the conversation we're having today. I think this is a great start uh, I look forward to more of this community dialogue, more engagement from the business community on these issues and figuring out how we all partner together to, uh, to again, move our state forward and help solve healthcare problems in Southern Nevada. So thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Maria Chagag. I'm the Director of Health Programs. Can everybody hear me? Okay. I'm the director of health programs here at the Lindsay Institute. I'm gonna do a little bit of logistics. For anybody who's standing at the doorway that wants to grab a seat, this is a good time, please feel free. Also, for anybody who hasn't had the opportunity to check their cell phones to make sure they're on vibrate or silence, please do so now as well. Um, Coming here to become the director of health programs, our job here at Lindsay Institute is really to both engage the community and figure out ways that we can help paint a better picture and yet a def different picture of Southern Nevada and in my case, create health, better health. For those of you who listen to like National Public Radio, I always listen to the morning show. At least once a week, there's always some kind of commentary on the health of Nevada. Even this morning, there was a discussion about what kind of medicine we would need in the fact that some areas would need a lot more general practitioners. And in Southern Nevada, we need a lot of specialty care because we will have an older population. So in thinking about that and trying to determine how can we make sure that we have the right medical practitioners for our population now and in the future with the things like the Affordable Care Act, with just what we have here. We have a wonderful um, doctor of osteopathy program with Turo. We have um, the new um, legislation that was just passed allowing nurse practitioners to be able to practice independently. Those are wonderful things and those will provide us with the primary care physicians we need. But how do we make sure that we have the holistic ability to provide care for the people who live here and who will be living here now and in 2030, 2060 and beyond? Well, and that was making sure that we have the physicians we need and that is mostly MD or allopathic. How do we get those numbers up? We look at saying, well, let's create clinical extensions. Let's, cre let's look at making sure we have more residencies and those things. The best way to get residencies is to get more doctors, to create more allopathic doctors. 
more MDs. So to do that, I looked to say, well, what would it really do? How would it impact our economy if we had more, if we had a med school? I know the idea of creating more doctors. I understand that idea, but what would it, how would it impact our economy? And so when I started reading the, the reports that are available online from places like Arizona and places like um, Orlando and other places, all of them used one calculator. That was the trip umba. That's the number everybody uses when they start talking about economic impact. Whether or not they use the company or not, they all use the trip umba calculator. So I called trip umba and said, how much would it cost for you to tell us what would be the economic impact of having a med school here? It was kind of a ABC conclusion. If you can tell us, at least we have a starting point. And the other thing that I wanted to do was make sure that the community was involved. As a public health clinician, we always do things kind of community-based participatory research. Their organization came here and did, they did about 60 interviews, but they probably tried maybe <laughs> <laughs> they probably tried, they, they contacted probably almost close to 100 people, but they conducted over, they conducted about 60 in, interviews, and that's not in Southern Nevada, that's in the state of Nevada. That means they went from north to south, east to west, the whole state. They conducted several, several interviews all over the state to engage the community. So they, yes, they had the optics on the, econo on the economy and how that would impact the economy, but they also talked to people. They also talked to key stakeholders to determine how that would play a, a factor in creating a med school here. And so we looked at how to determine how to create a med school. And it wasn't to create angst, it wasn't to create unhealthy competition, because there is such thing as Dr. Winnerity always says, is the healthy competition. When you look at other cities and the other burgeoning cities and great growing cities, most of them have multiple med schools. So it's not like anybody or any organization is trying to put one organization out in order to, to in, out of business. There's room for growth, there's room for multiple organizations to produce many different vectors of types of physicians. Because at the end of the day, it's the community that needs them so that we can all improve our health. I can't wait for the day when we can hear something in this region on national radio about how our health is great on how we are healthy and how we're moving forward and we're moving the needle in a positive direction on health. With that being said, we had um, Paul Umba come and do um, a, re well, the, the whole team, Julie and Angie and Paul, they all came out here and helped to do a, to do research in order to establish what would be the economic impact, meaning how many jobs, what would be the return on investment, uh, what would be, what would it best look like for us to be able to have a medical school here in Southern Nevada? And med school being allopathic MD granny because we know that we need specialty care. We know that we would like the research. Um, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas is always, is currently focusing on STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So they're always looking at where, where do we send these students who do want to, pursue science through, through medicine. So where do they go? Let's create pipelines so we can fill them with students who want to practice medicine. So Paul has been, um, has been working and consulting since 1990s. He gave me a very long one, long bio, and I decided I wasn't gonna read it all because when you meet him, you'll see, when you see his presentation, you can be impressed and make your own conclusions. But I wanted to make some highlights. Uh, his healthcare clients include 50 of the, hundred, of the hundreds of the nation's top 100 medical, um, leading hospitals and um, more than 150 of the nation's largest universities and more than 50 of the, for, of the, of the Fortune 500 corporations. He keeps his house small, but they do a lot of work. They do a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> so he has a diverse team of about 25 professionals and they work a lot, but they love what they do so they enjoy it. Um, they do community assessments both in small and large areas and they don't necessarily go with what people want to hear, they go with what's right and what's, what, what's right so they don't always come to a, an area and say this is what you need. 
they go and say this is what's best and this is what fits for the community that we've examined both with the numbers and with the organization. But one of the things that's great is that they have worked with the, um, a, the accreditation board of medical schools for the past 25 years. So they have a very unique data set that actually helps them to establish the, the, um, the economic impact of medical schools. He's published a lot and he's just really good at what he does. And so without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Paul Umba. Good morning, everybody. I want to thank you uh, for the warm welcome uh, you've given me and my team in the six months that we've been working together. Um, I'm going to introduce them right away. Uh, Julie Shamil is the project director. It's Julie. Uh, many of you probably talked with Julie on the phone in those uh, 60 interviews or so. And then one of our principals uh, in this area of our uh, practice is Angie Lockwood. And Angie's there as well. I just want to recognize our teammates. Uh, we have about an hour together and there's two goals. One is for, um, for us to share with you some highlights from the report that we wrote. And the second goal is to engage in some questions and answers. Um, one of the things that I want to make sure I do is provide the insights that you want to hear about. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, uh, pieces of information and I want to make sure that everybody in the room gets their questions answered. A uh, couple other uh, things about today. I, uh, we come from uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, all of us at Trip Umbach started in Pittsburgh, and then we're now in eight locations around the country. Uh, Julie's in State College, uh, Angie's in uh, Baton Rouge, but Pittsburgh's our, our town. And we used to, we usually say that Pittsburgh is the, the largest, uh, I mean, the smallest big city in America. Um, and I think that uh, Reno and us share that in that uh, we were the Las Vegas of America 100 years ago. And uh, I remember that if you look at the history, when Pittsburgh became the big new city about 100 years ago, a lot of people um, uh, were, were really surprised by our growth. Right now, we're about the same size metro area as Las Vegas. We're really close in, in size. Um, I want to just start by saying that uh, uh, I want to thank uh, Rob and Maria, and also the representatives from the from the chamber for their for their uh, uh, introductory words. I don't need to spend much time, except to say that our experience in the last several years has been in all different kinds of medical school environments. Uh, we were able to do uh, economic impact feasibility and planning for about 20 new or expanded medical schools. Uh, over the last seven years, and, and they fit into a lot of different categories. We have uh, new university medical schools like um, Grand Rapids, Michigan State, uh, Florida International. Um, we have some medical school programs that are new private schools like the Commonwealth School in Scranton. And then we have a whole bunch of regional campus projects we've worked on. We're currently working on some in Indiana. We've done regional campuses in the state of Washington with, uh, with the University of Washington. But there's a, a category that's very unique and different, and that's the category of what we call partnership medical schools. Um, in El Paso, Texas, uh, Texas Tech uh, created a, a, a campus in uh, El Paso. El Paso also a growing area that didn't have a, a medical school. In Georgia, in Athens, Georgia, the University of Georgia now has a new medical school in partnership with Medical College of Georgia. And then uh, a project that we're probably the most familiar with because we were there on the first day was the, the project in Phoenix where uh, there was only a medical school in Tucson and now there's a vibrant, growing allopathic medical school in, in Phoenix. And that was uh, started in partnership with Arizona State University. We'll get into a lot of detail. Um, one other thing, uh, we don't just do medical schools. We do about 100 projects at a time, and they're in all kinds of areas, a lot of them uh, in uh, university settings and, and healthcare. To do the project, um, you know, this economic impact assessment of an allopathic medical school is where we were, this was the, the uh, runway. Uh, uh, this is where we needed to land the plane. Uh, but to do this flight, we couldn't just start with this. We had to really look at the needs. Uh, we had to also look at uh, the program, the facility, 
and then to com come to economic impact. You kind of end up with economic impact, but you need to measure something. And one thing that was, I think, very helpful in this exercise was starting to look at the needs. And Angie and Julie and their team spent a lot of time really looking at a lot of the data that Maria and, and Rob had, had uh, just uh, gone over with you. And that was that we really have a situation in Southern Nevada where it is critical that healthcare not only improve in quality, not only improve in range of service, but also improve in how much economic impact that it has. Uh, one thing that I think is really important as you look at the future is to keep people here for their health care and to even go one step further and attract people for health care in the future. And one thing Las Vegas does very well and that is attract people and attract people for gaming, entertainment, food, uh, shows, we all know that, but for that same infrastructure to be able to use for people to come in the future for healthcare. We'll take an allopathic medical school because allopathic medical schools, the ones that give the MD degree, are research and clinically focused. They're research and clinically focused, which means that they're doing the research and they're developing the programs, destination medicine type programs. Osteopathic medical schools, which we work a lot with, we probably have 20 clients in that space, are educationally focused. Their focus is to allow students to be trained to then go typically to allopathic residencies to then uh, become doctors. So uh, both are needed, but an osteopathic school is what we are measuring. Uh, we looked at the size of what the medical school could be in uh, Southern Nevada. We looked at some cost estimates and some return on investment. And one thing about this project is, and maybe this was a little different than some studies, and that is that we were asked to make some recommendations on really the optimal model, a model that would work the best for the economic impact of the state. So through the lens of economic impact, we were asked to say, what would be the best option uh, to follow, looking at all these variety of options? And that's what our report uh, focuses on, and that is, okay, how can we have the economic impact grow at the current medical school, which I visited at uh, University of Nevada, Reno. I toured, I met people, um, and to look at that facility uh, and to see how could that continue to grow while a new medical school is developed <coughs> at it, it, uh, UNLV uh, on this campus. And in doing that, it was very important that we looked at ways that you could have economic impact grow statewide. It wouldn't have been worth doing a plan to uh, have one grow at the expense of the other, and it wouldn't be good at all for this uh, region uh, to have a, uh, a medical school solution that didn't capture all of the opportunity that was here. So that was, that's what our recommendations are based on. Um, really quickly, here are some of the things we did to do the study. Uh, lucky for us, the uh, University of uh, Nevada Reno's medical school had done an economic impact study uh, in 2011, so we were able to know what the current economic impact is. Um, we have been measuring since 1995 the economic impact of every uh, allopathic medical school. We have a database that we use that really has the full accounting of all the medical schools. And all medical schools in America together are about a quarter of a trillion dollar industry. Uh, and I'll get into some data on that in a little bit. Um, and then we also had our models from other projects and then uh, the 40 or 40 to 60 interviews that were done uh, with 26 organizations that Angie and Julie did. And then we also did a regional asset inventory. Very important in a project like this that you start with what you have in the state. And we found there were a lot of resources in the state on this campus, at UNR, and in other places. Um, the idea that there's no healthcare economy the idea that there's no education economy, we did not find that. Or that there's no culture for research, innovation, and education. Actually, we found in our asset inventory uh, quite a lot to work with. Uh, and although, uh, as Rob mentioned, you're below the national average for these things, 
as was also mentioned by the chamber representative, healthcare, education, and research were the fastest growing segments of the economy during the recession. So there's something there uh, to build on. Okay, we were asked to determine the, uh, the size of the, of the medical school class. And I wanna just say that 60 is a good number to start with for an allopathic medical school in its first class. And we did some uh, research and found that there's about 120 graduates from this region <coughs> that matriculate into medical schools around the country. So about 120 folks out of this metro area find their way to medical school every year. About 30 of them find their way to medical school at UNR, which leaves, easy math, about 90 students that are right now going somewhere else uh, for medical school. We think that that class by 2030 can grow to 120 students as there becomes more and more of a market for medical education and more and more of our young people in this region, knowing that there's a medical school in the community, knowing that there's a pipeline program at their junior high and their high school and their college uh, will stay in the region. But if we don't also develop about 240 new residency training positions, we'll lose those graduates. So we need to have places for them to go and complete their training. Um, everybody's at a different level of understanding on this. I didn't know anything about GME uh, when, I, when I first started this, but the, the bottom line is if you don't have a place for folks to complete their training, three to seven years typically, they won't stay in the, in the state. They'll go and complete their training, their residency somewhere else, and when they do that, they'll more than likely stay where they did. So if they did their residency in Roanoke, Virginia, even though they went to medical school here, they'll probably stay in Roanoke, Virginia. So I think that one of the things to keep in mind is that while we're developing this medical school uh, in Southern Nevada, um, the, the Las Vegas program will require more places uh, for folks to get residency training. Um, let me give you a couple ways that we started to look at economic impact. Our first way to look at it is, okay, for the state of Nevada, how much economic impact should medical schools have right now based on population? Very easy calculations, but not easy because we're not really sure how big Nevada is going to be in 2030. There's a wide range of estimates. Right now we know that the current population is about 2.75 million. We know that the, the metro population is about 2 million, but as Robin mentioned, if you start adding non Nevada parts, it actually is a little larger because of some of the uh, counties in neighboring states. The Census Bureau thinks that you'll be at about 4.1 million in 2030. Uh, there's a, um, an organization that does uh, projections in Washington, D.C. That, that sometimes we use at about 3.7, and the state demographer's office show the population growing from 2.7 to, to 3.4. Under any of those scenarios, Nevada is underperforming in how much economic impact it should get from its medical school or schools, depending on how we're going to look at it. Um, so the, the expected um, uh, economic impact right now for your 2.75 million people, you should have about a half a billion dollar medical education industry, okay? And currently, it's about half of that. Uh, the economic impact of the Reno program at UNR is 285 million, and that's based on their report from 2011. Um, if it grows, we use the woods and pool to generate this number. We use the 3.7 to generate the almost 700 million. If we use the 3.4, it wouldn't be that much different. What we're showing is, and if we use the Census Bureau, it would be more than that. And what we're saying is that Nevada as a state has opportunity to have a larger medical education, research, and clinical health care economy. And I think it, if you look at these numbers and then you think about uh, Rob's presentation before, you start to see that about a third of the dollars are left off the table. And where do those third of the dollars go? Well, they go to California. They go to other states. 
people fly out of here for health care. Very few people fly in for health care. Uh, very few students from here stay here to go to medical school. They leave, they do their residencies, and they practice in other places. Fewer doctors, fewer research grants, fewer clinical services becomes a downward spiral. So we think there's great opportunity to grow the economic impact. So then what we did was we looked at the three different models and we evaluated the economic impact of all three models. University affiliated, independent medical schools, and regional campuses of affiliated medical schools. And we looked only at this part of the report through the lens of economic impact. We'll get to other things later. We wanted to see what would be the best model to have the highest economic impact. And to do that, we started to look at our database and found that the average established university medical school in America has a $1.7 billion impact. And these are of all the medical schools, big and small, those that are university affiliated, like the <coughs> University of Arizona would be in there, the University of Washington would be in there, um, and, and all the other established university um, medical schools. And then the average economic of the public medical schools in states with a single public medical school is 1.1 billion. This would be the category that the Reno program uh, at UNR would be in. They're a uh, public medical school and they're the single one in the state. And this would be like uh, the University of, of, uh, of uh, Washington would be in this one. Minnesota would be in this one. You're going to go through Missouri would be in this one. The ones that are the, the, state, the state schools. Um, and then we looked at the standalone public universities having more than one public medical school. So this would be in states where there's more than one medical school. Uh, the, the, uh, the average in states where there's more would be 882 million. So if you look at the other states in the country, those that have two public medical schools that are separate still have an average of 882 million. When you look at the independent medical schools, like the Mayo Clinic Medical School, the Cleveland Clinic Medical School, the New Commonwealth Medical College in Scranton, and, and, and others, they have an impact of about 720 million. And when you look at regional campuses, four-year campuses, like if it was a four-year regional campus of uh, UNSUM here in Las Vegas, uh, it's about 245 million. Regional campuses do not have the same level of economic impact because most of the research and a big part of the clinical enterprise remain at the main campus. So we looked at all the regional schools in America. There are about 100 regional campuses in America that are accredited regional campuses of parent medical schools and the average is about $245 million a year. Not that that's a small amount, but the regional campus model does not provide the same economic impact to a community than a independent um, established medical school. So this is what we did. We, we came up with a recommendation that a full-scale, four-year, independent, publicly supported medical school in Las Vegas uh, would have the higher economic impact on this campus of, of UNLV uh, than, than it would have in, uh, in, in a regional campus environment. We feel that based on all the demographics and all the analysis we did, if we had to project at maturity in 2030, we think that Las Vegas could support a medical school that would have about $1.2 billion in annual economic impact. Now that's still below the $1.7 billion average, but we believe that in the amount of time that you have, you could have that grow to about $1.2 billion at maturity. We also showed that the UNSUM program would grow significantly from about $285 million to $600 million and to mean that the, the total for the state would be 1.9 million. And the reason why we did that was we started to look at what could happen to a sister medical school that helped start a medical school in Las Vegas if they were attached 
to clinical growth and research growth and education growth in, in a collaborative environment. And we showed that the Reno program would actually be able to achieve its potential by having this collaboration because there's so much money outside of Nevada that's left off the table. The amount of research that could be brought in, federal dollars that could be brought in, would be much higher if we were able to have both schools working together, <coughs> north and south, and throughout the rest of the state, to be able to bring those, those dollars in. And that's why we see that, that the total economic impact by 2030 could be close to $2 billion, and right now you're at $285 million. So I think our, our report shows a variety of tables uh, that show that. We also looked at the return on investment for facilities. And one thing that we looked at was uh, when you look at all the different facilities that were built, uh, the independent schools like Commonwealth, the University of Central Florida facility, most regional campus facilities are in about the $30 million. And one thing I want you to kind of think about is that the best return on investment are the university affiliated with about $12 return for every dollar invested. And I'm gonna make a little note about these numbers. Um, eventually, by 2030 and beyond, your campus will cost more than $80 million. But to get started, you need only about $80 million to have a four-year allopathic medical school. Eventually, if you go to the Phoenix uh, campus, you'll see that they've built research facilities, they've built clinical facilities, uh, TGen, which is a uh, biomedical research foundation, which is on the campus. They have a 80 to $100 million group of facilities now. Yes, eventually it will grow, but I think one thing we wanted to uh, make clear in our report is that the community can afford an initial medical school with everything you need for accreditation uh, for about $80 million. And then we base this recommendation for this collaborative approach. I think if there's one takeaway I want you to think about today is that after evaluating and going to Reno and being here in Las Vegas and looking at both universities, if there's one thing I want you to think about today is that the assets in the state at both UNR and UNLV provide, in my opinion, the best solution for a collaborative arrangement. And why? Number one, UNR has an established track record as a fully accredited statewide medical education program. The school has its full accreditation. It's been established for enough time that it is an important starting point for a collaboration with UNLV. We looked at UNLV and we found that they have strength in health science programs a successful dental school. Uh, there's already, and, uh, and uh, uh, Jackie's here from the simulation center, uh, there's already an example of collaboration at the simulation center, and that includes participation from both universities, the Board of Regents, and also other state universities and community colleges working together. We found that, that UNLV's current and future research growth trajectory as a comprehensive doctoral granting school has opportunity to continue to grow <laughs> and, and far surpasses any other educational institution in, in Southern Nevada. Uh, we also looked at all of the different assets that were in the community at the hospitals, at research institutes, at the Cleveland Clinic. We looked at the state, we looked at Clark County, we looked at all the different pieces and we conclude that the UNLV partnership with UNR would be the best way to leverage funds, the best way to build on what you already have, and the best economic impact for both at the end. And I feel that that's the real takeaway uh, from this study. So our numbers are based on that model. The model we came up with was a, um, a partnership program. And the way the partnership program would work is that, and this is the economic impact. Right now, the economic impact of UNSUM is, is $285 million. Uh, that's right now your state total. Uh, by 2020, we see the new school at UNLV as it becomes an independent school by 2020, uh, having about $300 million in economic impact. We see the uh, UNSUM program also growing 
in this same period. And then we see by 2025 and by 2030, the 1.2 billion, uh, which is 1,200 1, million. Um, one thing about Las Vegas is you've seen big numbers before, so I, I, I can throw them out. Uh, last night I was at a coffee shop and I only had a hundred dollar bill and I said I'm so sorry and the lady said this is Vegas we cash hundred dollar bills every third every third customer <laughs> and I said at my local coffee shop they don't have a hundred dollars in the whole till <laughs> and uh, and then we see the the UNSUM program growing uh, and this is about where it should be. If you want to know where the economic impact of your state medical school should be based on all factors, if I did a model that showed what should it be, it should be about what it's going to be in 2030. It should be bigger than it is now. It should have more research than it has now. It should have more and it will have more clinical um, and, and um, translational research and genomic capabilities that it has now. So really what this plan does is it gets a new medical school right size for this market and it gets a medical school in uh, northern Nevada that should be about as big as it, it needs to be and then that's how you get to your total. Uh, jobs, boy, jobs are really going to be uh, a big part of this story, uh, about 12,500 jobs totally. Right now, there's about 2,300, 2,400 jobs. Now you might say, wait a minute, there's only 1,200 employees in the, whole, in the whole enterprise. Well, these are total jobs, direct and indirect. The support jobs are included. So take about half of these away and you'll see what the, what the actual head count at the medical schools will be. Uh, but this is t showing the direct and indirect. So right now, there's about 1,200 uh, jobs uh, that are at the uh, UNR uh, medical school um, program. Government revenue is really important to look at. And the reason why it's so important to look at is right now, there's about $14 million that's generated. Now, I know that uh, this program gets more than $14 million in support from the state. And that's fine, because it's a very needed program. And you need to have state support to make an allopathic medical school work. But what's interesting is when you get down to here, the economic impact will generate tax revenue based on the tax model for the state of Nevada, based on the current situation. We don't know how it's going to change. But we're estimating that the tax revenue will be under just under $100 million. When you do the profiles and the business plan, this is more money than both medical schools will need annually uh, and way more money than will be needed to sustain the medical education enterprise from the state's perspective. So if I'm a state um, person, I'm going to look at this and say right now we're, we, we lose. We, we don't collect as much as we give, but that's fine because we're educating people to be doctors and it's helping us downstream a million times more. But by the middle part, we're starting to get into the kind of money that will be invested every year by the state. And by the end, this will actually make money uh, for the state. Now, I'll tell you from doing this modeling in places like Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania makes a ton of money off the six medical schools and off the $30 billion industry that our six medical schools makes. When we go to our state in Pennsylvania, we say, here's what medical education means in return on investment. And our state says, yeah, it's one of the biggest drivers of our state's tax collection. Okay? You're not there yet, but this model shows that there's a great opportunity to show increase in government revenue that comes from all the spin-off of the medical schools. Um, we felt that the benefits of the program, so I guess your next question might be, okay, why do a partnership program? There are partnerships that have been formed in Arizona. There have been partnerships formed in Virginia, partnerships formed in Georgia. There have been partnerships formed in Texas and many other states. There was a partnership program a long time ago in Louisiana where there was a four-year medical school only in New Orleans with LSU. Now there's a four-year medical school separately accredited in Shreveport. Same way in Duluth, Minnesota, around the country. Why this partnership? Well, first of all, you already have a, a medical school that is accredited 
and it's faster and easier for that medical school to work with the folks at UNLV and in the community, and I'm really gonna say and the community. When I say UNLV, I mean UNLV, hospitals, industry leaders like the chamber, community leaders, I really think it's gotta have to be a team uh, approach with UNR to be able to get this collaborative relationship established. The second uh, benefits is there'll be more fresh dollars attracted if the two schools work together to go after federal funds and grants and private funds and Gates Foundation and you name the foundations you want to work with, then if they compete, if an application goes out and both schools can apply together and get the money, it's going to work a lot better than one wins, one loses. Or worse, neither wins because they disqualify each other. Or they're not strong enough to do the grant because you only have one school trying to qualify and the other school trying to qualify. So I feel it's going to attract more fresh dollars. Second, it's maximum growth potential. The clinical services supported by the two schools, the graduate medical education infrastructure of two schools working together will actually do something that seems almost unthinkable today. It's almost unthinkable that people wouldn't leave Nevada for high-end health care. And it's completely unthinkable today that people would fly here to get their health care. Completely unthinkable. Uh, it's, it's as unthinkable as in the 1970s that people would fly to Pittsburgh from all over the world to get transplants, the transplant center of the world. It's unthinkable <coughs> that Pittsburgh would be a place that would have a $20 billion health care sector that's now per capita the highest in the country. Same kind of unthinkable. But that can happen. As, as our community had to really restructure uh, to meet the, the demands of the future. And then, obviously, there's more financial support. I feel if you have eventually uh, your own uh, medical school campus in Las Vegas, I think it's going to help with uh, philanthropy. It's certainly going to help with community support to know that initially UNR will work with the community to develop an accredited medical school, but at a certain date and time, and my report actually gives a date. I believe that by 2020, on January 1st, you should have it in your sights. That should be uh, the runway you're gonna land the plane on. And on 2020, January 1st, in my report, I say you should have a UNLV separately accredited medical school. Whether you all come up with a different date or not, that's what I had put forth. But I feel that that's going to get the energy you need to start really fundraising and getting the community behind this. So, final slide. Recommended next steps. We're right on time. I wanted to do it right in a half hour. Um, <clears throat> sign letter of intent uh, in November. Uh, I really believe strongly that the two universities have to start by having a letter of agreement to do this collaboratively. Um, I think it's more important that it even comes from the two universities and then goes through uh, the regents and then from the regents to the legislature, the governor's office, the community. Um, I think if you don't have two universities that are committed to working together, it, it can't be mandated. I've been in other states where it's been handed down to the schools. I was in states where schools were told, uh, some states, schools went on fishing trips. Some states, uh, schools went to anger management class. Uh, schools were, where it was mandated, but the spirit wasn't there because it didn't come from them. It was sort of mandated and imposed on them. I think then we need to do a, a business plan and implementation strategy uh, and also include graduate medical education in that in January through June of, of, of next year. Begin the accreditation process, secure leadership, expand the clinical, and also to start having a, a bioscience marketing campaign at the same time. I really believe that this region can market itself. One nice thing about your region is uh, you sound like a great place. Um, Pittsburgh, we've had to deal with that for a long time. <laughs> um, we missed by two votes being called Forbes. It was two votes. It was either going to be Pitt or Forbes. We're going to name the whole city after. We, pit, we picked Pitt. Okay, 
probably not the best thing from a branding perspective, <laughs> but we've had to deal with it. Las Vegas has a great brand, okay? So marketing Las Vegas for economic bioscience would definitely raise a question in people's minds. Really? That's interesting. Let's look at that. Let's look into that. I know I can fly there. I know where to stay when I get there. They have a few restaurants. I think I'm okay with that. Let's go and do business with them. The thing I want to just end with is what a pleasure it's been to have an opportunity to work in your state, working both in Reno and in the, uh, Las Vegas, to work with the Lindsay Institute has been a real honor to us. I uh, want to also say that there's a lot of work to be done. We've laid out the first step, uh, some recommendations, some economic impact, some pathways to, to look at. We also understand that the most important thing today is making sure that your questions uh, get answered. I will help with questions about the study. There'll be a panel discussion later in the morning where we can get into a lot more issues. Um, I'm interested, very excited about answering your questions and providing whatever help I can. I'm gonna just um, ask who wants to share first. We'll get started. We have a microphone coming around so it's recorded and uh, our friend uh, will we'll do that. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm Senator Joe Hardy, State of Nevada, also an Associate Professor of uh, uh, Primary Care at Turo University okay. of Nevada. Uh, I appreciate the study uh, that you've done. I noticed that the study obviously has some concerns and needs to be fleshed out. Yeah. I appreciate the comment about the conversation uh, that we need to have. And uh, obviously, we're going to have to extend the study. It's, it's not done. Um, and the GME comment to expanding the clinical, I think, is critical. Yeah. Uh, I would, uh, and now my questions, and I wrote these down, so I won't try to bore you with all my fleshed out questions. Um, the concept of research, obviously, uh, and I say the word obviously on purpose, osteopathic schools do research as well. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear us mention uh, Roseman uh, that is in this. I think they cut me off on purpose. <laughs> um, Roseman uh, Medical School is coming. Yeah. And I didn't see that addressed in your uh, presentation. Uh, likewise, the state cost for a public medical school uh, is different than a private medical school, such as Turo, which doesn't use state dollars, so that multiplies money even easier. Uh, hospitals, if we look at the Texas model of a medical center that's not really a center, but a consortium of hospitals, I think that's one of the challenges we're going to have with the clinical instruction and trying to get enough clinical uh, instruction to happen so that's Senator now Martin, happening in both. If, so your question is about including Roseman and, and the hospital structures? That's that's definitely one of them, and I. If we could stick to one. Okay. And then we'll, and, we'll come and back. And the rest of my question is the goals and the residencies. Well, and we're going to start with the hot with with the uh, with Roseman. And the economic impact and the clinical effect on unsum. Appreciate that, and I have them written down, so I'll give them to you. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Good. Well, thank you for all those questions. I I would say, uh, first of all, that a collaboration between Roseman, Turo, and all the other uh, providers uh, of education and research in the area is, is a very important collaboration that needs to be developed. I also understand from doing national studies for the osteopathic medical schools, of which we have about 20 or 30, that they do do research, but the scale of the research enterprises are different. So I feel that uh, graduate medical education, your other point, is really important because all these students will be educated in Las Vegas at all these different schools and will need those placements. As far as the, 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 the question about where are we in terms of uh, building this, this relationship with the state, uh, we have nothing in our report that shows yet what kind of financial commitment the state would need to make on the operations side. And the reason for that is that there are many new state-supported medical schools that are providing much more 
of, of a private sector model. Uh, at, at Virginia uh, Tech, uh, their deal with the state was build us an $80 million facility and we won't ask for state support. In other markets, we've gotten into situations where the state will only match $1 for every $2 that's privately. Uh, so the gentleman's comment about how much state support, we don't have in our report any number about that. What I have also found, and it was found also at UCF in, in Florida and at Commonwealth, is that the community raised enough money to support the first four years of the medical school class, which brought in a very good quality student. And now the folks in Scranton and UCF are raising the funds again for the tuition. So the states are paying much less than they traditionally paid. But I also want to go on record as saying it's very important that during this transition, the UNR program maintain its support from the state. Because it's going to be, for the first six years, the parent of the new medical school from an accreditation perspective. So I think it's very important that the state continue to support the current program during that period so it can stay strong enough to be the parent of the new program. So I, would think, I think I got almost all of the, the questions. I look forward to receiving the rest, but those were, that was a quick flyover for, for the questions you have, and I appreciate it. Hi. Hi. Hey, Anna, is this working? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm Lindy Schumacher. Um, I used to work at the Lindsay Foundation, Dream Fund at UCLA, and, and we are probably the group that paid for your report. So I have two questions, okay. if you could allow. The first question is, we have a 30-year history of kind of begging UNR to participate in, in this conversation, and, and I use that word loosely. There has been zero, as far as I'm concerned, progress in this, in this front. So as we proceed forward, and your report shows that this is the smart thing to do to work with an accredited university, to work with an accredited medical school, this helps UNR, it helps Southern Nevada, Northern Nevada. What if there is no interest? If we have a 30-year history of showing that there is very little interest, how is that different even with, with or without your report? And what was your backup plan? If UNR were to say, you know what, we see no value in this, so yet show us the report, we don't care. Um, couldn't we find an accredited med school outside of Nevada who would want to partner? I'm saying that because I hear that all the mm -hmm. time. I mean, yeah. I am not in Northern Nevada. I am in Southern Nevada and I'm tired of waiting. And I can tell you there are five med schools who would plop themselves mm -hmm. down at UNR, put their name on it, give their accreditation up and let's move forward and let's do it tomorrow. Okay. Uh, you know, to say I have to wait till 2020 to have my own med school named UNLV's med school, I don't know if I want to wait any longer. I'll be honest, I've, I felt like I've given up 30 years of my life waiting for something that made sense for the entire state and it hasn't happened. Okay. So I, I sound angry because guess what? <clears throat> I am and I'm a southerner <laughs> and you have every regent sitting here. Second question, at least almost every regent sitting here if they're not Good all question. here. My second question is your, your proposal included the part of let the community rally cry this. Let the presidents of the university grovel this one out. Let them do what's best then go to legislator, oh, and then by the way, get the blessing of the regents. That's not the way the state works. Mm -hmm. The state works completely opposite of that. We have, I'll just say it, the regents are gonna make this decision before the presidents of the universities are gonna look at it, before the communities can have any input whatsoever. It could stop right here today and we'd call it a day. I mean, that's how fast this happens. So I think we're a little naive to think that the presidents are gonna figure this out because that's not the way it works here. Okay. Good question. I know, I sound <clears throat> angry. Sorry. I appreciate the questions. Um, let's start with a few things. One thing is, I'm pretty confident after working uh, for the six months with folks at both universities and also working uh, with the regents and meeting with many of the regents privately and also having the conversations we've had with the chancellor and others, I'm confident that this is a workable solution that will be and maybe there's 30 years of history, but in my six months of history, I believe there will be an opportunity for a letter of intent to be signed very quickly, if not within the next few days even. 
So I'm confident that that will happen because of the report and because of the energy that, that we have. The second comment is we did evaluate regional campuses of established medical schools and there just aren't that many that have ever happened where they've come to a different state and put in a regional campus. And when we did the analysis, it looked like that regional campus from a UCLA or from a Texas Medical Center or from a University of Washington uh, would be, or Stanford, would be about the size of any other regional campus and it wouldn't give you the same economic impact of a UNLV owned and operated and controlled medical school. Let me get to the third question. Why don't we just do a UNLV medical school right now today and have it separately accredited and have it on its own? Well, it takes longer than the amount of time that I've put in place to establish an independent medical school that's accredited because the accreditation process is about four years versus two years. The other thing is if you don't have the support of the entire state, you might be in a situation where you're fighting over state funds where it might be better to work together in a package deal as long as there's a date when UNLV's medical school becomes separate and that date has to be uh, put into place very quickly. Final point I want to make, and I really appreciate your anger because that shows that there's passion, and that is that, I think it's a really important point, and that is this community will have a four-year medical school at some point. It's not a matter of if it will, it's when it will, and the solution I came up with and our, our team came up with is our best way to make it happen as fast and as effectively as possible. And I understand all your other comments and appreciate them. So, Just a couple of economic questions in terms of your data and how it's presented. Yeah. The use of per capita in terms of economic impact um, is one way to estimate what could happen here. Right. However, your example of Pittsburgh, where it's a $20 billion impact, yeah. and I'm sure <clears throat> Johns Hopkins, et cetera, there are many that are way up and right. therefore drive the per capita above right. what it would be. Yeah. More relevant, and I think a better way yeah. of providing information, would be if you looked at all of the medical schools and gave data on what the 25th percentile, 50th, <clears throat> 75th, et cetera, are, yeah. so that there could be a recognition of where it might fall. Similarly, in terms of the data, uh, if the first class were to enter 2016-17, right. to say that the impact by 2020 would be, I think it was $301 million, mm -hmm. dollars, which is above what is currently the impact of the Reno campus. Um, I question that just in terms of everything yeah. from NIH <clears throat> funding right. to the fact that there wouldn't even be a medical school uh, group that had yet graduated, much right. less the full faculty complement, and you yeah. had 2006 jobs. So mm -hmm. those are the two things I'd be interested to know, right. 25th, 50th, 75th percentiles, right. and also where the patients will come from. Southern California, with UCLA and their medical center, Cedars-Sinai and the rest, I, mm -hmm. I think they're clearly going to remain a magnet. So those are my questions. Good questions. I, fr I really appreciate that. Um, when we did the analysis, we put all of the medical schools into different groups. And I feel the most relevant number is the number of about one billion. That's about what a medical school in a state like Nevada, if you look at the medical schools in similar states like Utah, Arizona, if you look at, at uh, states like Nebraska, and you look at their state medical schools in peer states that are in the 50%, uh, 75%, and 25%, and if you start to look at those tiers, you'll see that a billion dollars is kind of a, a ballpark number. You'll see an outlier, but mostly it's about a billion dollars is what a medical school should be. Now, the 
real good question is, how do we in six years get the economic impact of the Las Vegas program in its partnership years to be at around 300 uh, plus million, which is bigger than the, than the Reno program right now? Well, in the AAMC database, we have the economic impact of Central Florida, El Paso, Grand Rapids, uh, FIU, Commonwealth and Scranton, um, Roanoke, uh, Virginia Tech, and the average is, is around uh, 350 million. And the reason being is that those programs to get to be accredited as a four-year full-scale campus had to hire a, a large complement of basic science, clinical faculty, and had to put together partnerships with their hospitals, okay? And because of that, they get pretty quickly to about the 200 to $350 million economic impact, and that's based on their, their, their size that they currently have. Now keep in mind that I think a real important point is it's gonna require a lot of effort and a lot of participation to be able to have the new school put into that pathway for growth. The key to helping the school in, in Reno is to open up that same pathway and that same trajectory to that school as well. Because right now you have an underperforming economic impact underperforming medical school because you don't have the clinical and research growth that you need to have, okay? So my feeling is that if we, if we start today, as the chancellor mentioned, we're starting today, and on that trajectory, we start to say by 2020, how would it look to be at this size? Do you notice also in this chart, we showed a lot of growth through the Reno program in those same six years. And that's gonna be the challenge to the state of uh, Nevada is to catch up. Uh, but yet this data from the other new medical schools, according to the AAMC, is that those schools have achieved about the $300 million number. And that's where we got that number from. We looked at the others, how they were four years out, <coughs> six years out to do that. I appreciate your question. Uh, it's a challenge. I, I definitely understand that. Yes. Yeah, this, I'm Jim Thompson from UNLV. Uh, I have a, a bunch of technical questions which probably don't belong in this forum. And I can email you and, sure. and uh, ask you about those. But one of them has to do, some of them have to do with your, your arguments in favor of a partnership. Yeah. And you don't present any data. You, when you were talking, you were saying words like, I believe, and so forth. Right. But you mentioned case studies. So I'm in particular interested in the one on philanthropy. Right. Um, you know, I've raised money in my career. Philanthropy is a very local thing. Yeah. When, when uh, UCR raised money for, uh, for the new Riverside, for the new medical school there, I can, I'm pretty sure they weren't getting that money from millionaires in Westwood. Uh, they were getting it from people out there. Right. And I think, so wh what's the basis for thinking like that? And then finally, just a, a, key, a point on them. I'm good to, good to hear about the MOU. You know, I've signed a lot. We also, there are things that have to happen after an MOU. Yeah. Uh, that's a, critically important. She was not asking about a uh, regional campus of an out-of-state out school. She was asking about a partnership to help set up UNLV's own school. So post MOU and as things develop, I want to see what happens there. Okay, real good questions. I appreciate them all. Uh, a couple things. First of all, I agree that local support for your own medical school in places around the country has always worked better. There was a situation at uh, Commonwealth in Scranton where Penn State came up and visited when they were thinking about doing this program and, and the dean who's now the president of the AAMC is a good friend of mine said to the um, community, give me a hundred million and I'll make you a Penn State um, regional campus. And the community thought about that and they went and talked to me about that and they said, what do you think? I go, well, if you're gonna raise $100 million, you might as well have your own medical school because you'll be able to raise the next $100 million. If you raise $100 million, give it to Penn State, you'll probably have a regional campus that will be a nice regional campus, but it won't be the regional campus that your community would support. Well, it proved to be true there. It proved to be true in Grand Rapids. It's proved to be true in South Florida. 
when you know this is something that's in your community, the philanthropy follows much, much stronger. The question that you, you raise about the data um, uh, and the MOU and the out-of-state schools, um, we thought long and hard about that. There just aren't a lot of examples yet, and this goes to your question as well. There just aren't a lot of medical schools that are established nationally, high-profile medical schools that have gone out of state and uh, now there, there are with the osteopathic programs, back to the uh, Senator's uh, really good comment, uh, Lake Erie College of Medicine has had a very successful medical school in Florida. And we know that the Cleveland Clinic has had a successful clinic operation in Jacksonville and in Scottsdale. We know that the Cleveland Clinic, uh, the Mayo Clinic, we also know that some medical schools, like PCOM out of Philadelphia, has done very well in Georgia. But for allopathic medical schools, there isn't a lot of history of somebody coming and helping you start your own. It would be better to either start your own or work with your existing medical school in the state because I feel in either model, knowing, remember I have 75 clients that are established medical schools. I'm working with many of the top tier medical schools and they're struggling right now. They're struggling for funding. They're struggling to figure out the Affordable Care Act, like all of us are. They're struggling because NIH research, which really propped them all up. So you might say, well, let's just get UPMC from Pittsburgh because they're an $11 billion medical school. Let's let them take care of us. Well, their margins went from this to this and now they're not in strong positions. So I think one of the other things to keep in mind is what we might have thought about five years ago, we really can't think about because the established schools are not that aggressive right now. They've held back and, uh, and they got their own issues because they now need to keep their population healthy in places like Philadelphia, Boston, Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Cleveland. I'm the founding dean of the public health school here which happened about eight years ago. And uh, we tried to have a joint school of public health with UNR. And we went through unbelievable numbers and huge amounts of money getting consultants in to bring people together to try and have us work together. And it didn't work. But something has happened, which I feel now that I'm happy to hear what Chancellor Clay says, but I was much angrier <laughs> than Lindsay about that School of Public Health because we worked so hard and we needed it and it was so clear we needed it. But, but now what's happened, something what I think is wonderful that has happened that has somehow changed at least the atmosphere here. And that is that uh, Tom Schwenk hired a person, uh, Rob Langer, to work in Las Vegas with UNLV for on research. And we have had, over the past year and a half, this incredible cooperation going on between the school, which resulted in a $20 million grant from NIH just one month ago. Yeah. And that would never have happened if it wasn't a collaboration between yeah. UNSUM and UNLV, yeah. and it's it's the incredible thing. It's I mean, like I w one year ago I would have been Lindsay <laughs> coming up here doing, but this has been incredible, and we have now linked with somebody in the medical school. What happened with that? UNLV had to link with somebody in the medical school, so most of them are linked with medical school uh, in Las Vegas. But we have one in, in Reno because we didn't have an asthma expert here. So we now are linking with an asthma expert at, uh, you know, at, in Reno. Yeah, so happening. this, but, but the caution is that only a small number of people are seeing that. Yeah. And I would like to know or I would like to suggest that what needs to happen at UNR is that you have this same kind of presentation which tells people that UNR will prosper under that and not be 
because there's all this is boiling group of people who are the naysayers who constantly are throwing uh, you know darts at each other or larger things and but it's it's but my impression is you know hurt. that we are people are wanting to do that yeah. all these medical school people are so happy they have somebody yeah. to research with because they never did before we're working with UMC we're working with the various yeah. hospitals right. sunrise we have yeah. people everywhere okay. now wanting to come to us mm -hmm. to do research because now we have now this one grant will give us the leverage for the next grants right. so I think it'd be wonderful yeah. Good question. The question was, how are we going yeah. to present this, present this to UNR so this and bring this? There's been, several, there's been several questions about whether or not this slide presentation will be available. It will be on the web as well as so will this, rep, so will this um, actual presentation. It will be on the, the Lindsay Institute website. So there are several people from UNR who are actually here. Many mm -hmm. were invited. There are many people who flew in today who are actually here right now. Yeah. And they will be able to, to access it online. And this will be available in various formats. That's and good. what happens next will determine h how engaged and where they will appear again. Yeah, that's a really good point. Sometimes things happen by chance and sometimes they happen on purpose. And I'm not sure if it was by chance or on purpose, but I do want to say something. When I came to Nevada the first time on this project, I spent my first days at UNR before I came to UNLV, before I came to Las Vegas. And I felt that by going there first and having the engagement there first, we were able to listen. I'd love to have the opportunity to take the presentation to Reno. I think it would be helpful for everybody to see the same presentation and to ask, ask questions and get answers. So that would be wonderful. And we believe in community. That's why we're here first. So I mean, right. it, it's community that brought us here. It's community will continue to move the process along. Yes, right. yes please. Absolutely. We're there's one person with a mic here, and then we'll move to this yeah, side of the room, and then moving. I know there's somebody else who has a mic there, and then we will end the conversation. Because yeah, there'll be more time for conversation after the break, so we don't want the conversation to end. Please stay. There, there's plenty of time, I promise. Yeah, I'm Bob Langer, and uh, I'm proud to have appointments at both the School of Medicine and UNLV, and uh, I really thank uh, uh, Dean Guinan for uh, discussing further our new grant, which I think, not just the grant, but other things that we've been able to pull together with me being here in Las Vegas this last year, really demonstrate the way that we can cooperate between the two campuses and really help an academic medical entity grow here in Las Vegas. Uh, that said, I'm also an epidemiologist, and one of the things that we do in epidemiology is we look at covariates and adjust for things. I'm a strong advocate of an academic medical center compared to other um, somewhat uh, uh, less academically oriented uh, mm -hmm. uh, centers. And I'm concerned, what about the potential impact on the economic effect that you predict for a UNLV medical school with Roseman and Toro also in the market? How do you adjust for that? Well, actually, it adjusts the other way. What's interesting about economic impact, and it's a very good question, and that is there's not only so many grains of sand in the sandbox, and you will get your pile over here, but because Roseman and Toro, and also UNR has a strong presence in Las Vegas, that we have to move the sand around. What's great about medical education and research is the sandbox adds more sand. So you have Philadelphia with five medical schools. You have Boston with more than three. You have New York City with 14. But you also have other places in the country where you're getting even more than your fair share. Right now, everything we've talked about today is how do you even get to your fair share? There are places in the country that are getting more than their fair share because of the collaboration. More researchers come to these different schools. More scientists come in. More innovation starts to happen. Uh, so you have a situation where you don't have a set number that you can have. The only determining factor, and this is an important point, is the pipeline of young people. 
that are right now in sixth grade that will want to get into the health professions and become a doctor or a nurse practitioner or a PA. And if you don't have that, that becomes a limiting factor. If you also don't have the places where they can be trained after medical school, that becomes a limiting factor. So building that pipeline, there are many things we didn't recommend in the report, but I think one thing we need to recommend is that from K to 25, we have a K through 25 view of the world that people are gonna be excited about uh, this kind of career. So, and then you can have all the medical schools you want, as long as you have the market that, that is directed. Now, what is that gonna mean? A lot of things. Next question. I, I don't have a question, I have a comment. Yeah. I understand the impact of this discussion is economic, or it's focused on economics, but I think we're, we're forgetting the issue of the quality of medicine. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in saying that, I think 100% in agreement with the young lady across the way, which is if we don't have a school ultimately at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, with its own identity, and continue to have separate research and clinical campuses, we'll never be able to attract the best of the medical students because yeah. they're looking, those with the top MCAT scores are looking for institutions where they can get into translational research, work in the lab, work in the clinical field at the same time, and similarly, faculty. We have excellent faculty. Gee, I'm looking at the trauma faculty here. World class. But they're, well, and they deserve applause. They're quite, they truly are. <coughs> um, but, they're, but they're also isolated uh, in, that, in that sense. Uh, they have had the ability to build a, a crazy good trauma center. But, but that can't be said for every section because some of those other parts of the medical school are more dependent on basic research, translational research, and that we've done a really poor job. Yeah. And, and you can't do it separated by 400 miles. Last thing, UCLA and UC San Diego are separated by less than half the distance that Las Vegas and Reno are. The idea that we'll just send our kids down or up to San Diego or LA to do their research it would, would be laughed at. So. We have Thank one you. more question. We'll take a break. We have a community panel where we can continue this discussion. Yes, hi, I'm Deborah Cools. Um, I'm part of the University of Nevada School of Medicine faculty here in Las Vegas. I've lived in Las Vegas for over 13 years. By training, I'm a trauma surgeon, and half of my time as Associate Dean of Academic Affairs. I, I'd like to just um, echo something that Mary Guinan said, and something has changed. Um, and I think since our Dean has arrived, and unfortunately he could not be here today, he had um, a prior engagement, and many of us came back early from the AAMC educational meeting to attend this meeting. But he has a famous saying that the, our history is our floor. We really have to get beyond that. And I think that's, that's been helpful to us. I'd also like to commend you on looking at partnership um, campuses. One of the groups that I'm very active on is the group on regional medical campuses. And, and I've interviewed, I developed a structured interview um, for all of the partnership um, campuses, and so I've talked to many of them. And it does take a lot of work, but it really takes the spirit of um, cooperation and collaboration. And I think our rallying point is the health care of our population. I mean, we all know that our demographics are poor, and, you're, and you didn't get to that. Um, and, and that's another rallying point in addition to, to economy. My question, though, is in your predictions, there are about 300 of us faculty and staff here in Las Vegas, and we have several hundred residents that are literally growing by the year. Um, how did how did that factor into your economic analysis? And part of our challenge, I think, is that we don't own a building. We all live in rented space all over the valley. Yeah. And if we just look at a facility, which is one of the things I, I've done to just house our existing people, yeah. it's a lot of money. Yeah. So yeah. I, I just like to know how yeah. you factor those right. economics um, in, into your calculations. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that question. The $285 million in annual economic impact is statewide. It includes an army of folks from UNR and in joint positions here in the Valley. The other thing that's interesting is that we need that base. And one of the reasons why we're promoting 
and recommend, recommending a partnership campus is because of that base. Can you imagine going in the direction of creating your own everything? What about the UNR folks that are already here that are already doing research, collaborative grants, trauma surgeon teaching, clerkships, GME, and the residency positions that are already here, it would be very, very, very difficult to, in a sense, compete during that startup phase. And that's another reason I th really appreciate that. I think the final point I want to make is back to the, the first se sentence. Why? The quality of health care, the quality of life, and the best for the state of Nevada is to get all the resources we have and get them moving in the same direction. Um, I think forward, not back, the way we have to look at this. And I feel that what you've said is very, very important that people know there are uh, resources here. There is research being done here. And there are residency positions already have. Not enough. It needs to be more. But it's already here. So thank you. Thank you. We'll I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks.